Postmodernity is a pagan epoch, a time of specters and syncretic gods. Our politics no longer deal with legitimacy, but with legitimation. Facts dissolve into facticity. With no recourse to an overarching truth, society fractures along previously buried epistemic fault lines, its collapse hastened by the algorithmic logics of social media and capital. It is in this context that the Netflix documentary The Social Dilemma sets out to interrogate the social rot at the forefront of our discourse today. The film presents experts who warn us about the psychological effects of staring at our phones, or of the impending existential threat to democracy in the form of hyperpolarization. Addiction, polarization, radicalization, outrageification, vanityification, this is overpowering human nature, and this is checkmate on humanity. We must trust these experts, because they are responsible for this crisis. They are the fallen and the redeemed, those who knew enough to engineer such a monstrosity and then to denounce it. These experts admit that they have fallen prey to their own algorithms, gotten caught in the snares of their own design. We gasp and then nod furiously, our faith in them now cemented. After all, what kind of devil is it who takes no pride in his triumphs, who eschews hubris for humility, and comes before us, his subjects, with remorse, offering truth instead of temptation? No devil at all or perhaps a new demiurge for our new era, whose deception runs so deep that to question it is to question the social itself. And that is exactly what we'll do in this video. First, we'll venture into postmodern philosophy to examine the film's claim that there even remains a singular truth which opposes itself to falsehood. And then we'll perform a post-structuralist reading of the film itself to identify how it rhetorically positions itself as a trustworthy text and to discover how it profits off of the very crises it purports to address. It was the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard who recognized that we once again live amongst many gods to be worshipped. What this means is that each of us inhabits and deploys different language games, or what he would later term phrase regimens, when speaking or thinking about the world. Every kind of phrase, be it a question, command, argument, or lyric, operates according to the rules of its own game, so to speak. These rules constitute a regimen of intelligibility and practicality. They define what kinds of phrases are able to make sense, how much stock we should put into their claims, whether we should understand them metaphorically or literally. For Leotard, this manner of epistemological existence is new, or more precisely, it is so antiquated as to confront us as novel. He writes, Lamenting the loss of meaning in postmodernity boils down to mourning the fact that knowledge is no longer principally narrative. Rather, our principal regime of knowledge was, until recently, that of science. Lyotard famously defined the postmodern as an incredulity towards metanarratives. A metanarrative is a universalized system of thought which purports to structure and explain all that exists. Since the Enlightenment, Science and religion have been the two dominant meta-narratives, but we'll focus on science here since it is the one still clung to by the social dilemma. Science posits the existence of universal truth in the rules of its own game, and it is to this truth that all of its appeals are made. In making truth imminent to itself, science delimits all other regimes of knowledge from making truth claims, because in its own conception, science is the only system capable of such an endeavor. It is legitimated by the falsifiability of its findings and the consensus of its experts. In other words, its ability to seek out truth is self-sustaining. It is both the meter stick and the whole metric system. To the scientific language game, Leotard opposes narrative knowledge, which instead arrives at the truth of utterances via notions of beauty, efficiency, justice, and metonymy. This is the register in which we find fake news, conspiracy theories, spirituality, and any other items which defy categorization by Enlightenment standards. But it is important to remember here that science is the aberration. Human beings have overwhelmingly lived narrativistic lives. It is only now that we, the misbegotten offspring of the Enlightenment, have begun to return to narrative in the wake of our crumbling universals. In this way, 
The lament of the rationalist is really a secret dirge for the enemy. Unconsciously, we mourn that narrative understanding should have ever had any epistemological competition at all. Easy examples of narrative knowledge at work can be seen in the QAnon movement, a broad conspiracy theory that alleges Donald Trump is fighting an invisible war against a global cabal of satanic pedophiles. After Trump was hospitalized with COVID-19 in October, he released this video, which Twitter user and QAnon follower Carrie for truth explicated in a now-deleted tweet. Trump's video is swaying up and down. Hunt for Red October is about a submarine. Depth, 50 feet. Zero bubble. Rigged for red is a ship term. Watch the water. Trump is safe under the water in a military submarine. Sleep peacefully tonight. The plan is underway. Within two sentences, we recognize we are not working in a traditional phrase regimen. Carey's interpretation hues closer to something like poetic free association, an assonance of color, form, and metaphor, than it does to anything scientifically legible. But there is nevertheless a logic which we can attempt to follow. Red October refers to the Russian October Revolution, red with blood. The formal quality of the image, its swaying motion, sets the viewer on edge, primes them to look for hidden meanings. To be rigged for red is to prepare the submarine to go to periscope depth. It conveys an egress to a more privileged position of knowledge or attack. Working narratively, Carey arrives at the conclusion that Trump is sequestered underwater while he prepares a red day of reckoning for his foes. It makes perfect sense once we ignore every rational sense-making instinct that we have. In January 2017, Kellyanne Conway first used the phrase alternative facts, alternative facts. Alternative facts. Alternative facts. Why did he do that? to describe the crowd size at Donald Trump's inauguration. And in August 2018, Rudy Giuliani insisted quite plainly that truth isn't truth. A, a conversation truth is truth. about... I, I don't mean to go like... I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. Chuck Todd... Having already dealt with Conway's assertion, warned Giuliani that his utterance would become a bad meme if not retracted. Only Conway and Giuliani were both correct. All facts are alternative, all news is fake, and truth is never truth. The social dilemma comes close to this insight in its discussion of curated news feeds and search results. Each person has their own reality with their own facts. Notice how the man hesitates to say, own facts. But that is precisely what we are dealing with. What is at stake is the very system by which we legitimate raw, discrete information and transform it into a fact. When you go to Google and type in climate change is, you're going to see different results depending on where you live. And that's a function not of what the truth is about climate change, but about the particular things that Google knows about your interests. In the case of climate change, we encounter what Leotard calls a different, a case of conflict between at least two parties that cannot be equitably resolved for lack of a rule of judgment applicable to both arguments. Either side of the discourse has become so heterogeneous that no standard of truth can satisfy both arguments at once. Because translation between different regimens is unthinkable, consensus is a priori impossible. We all simply are operating on a different set of facts. That means we aren't actually being objective, constructive individuals. But where the social dilemma fails is in its modernist adherence to the scientistic idea of universal truth. I use scientistic over scientific deliberately. The former refers to an idolized vision, one which takes for granted the functioning of its own method. It is incurious and inartistic, everything science should not be. Scientism is in this way the theological operation of the scientific method. The film still speaks in terms of real and fake news, of reality and its conflations. And we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. But Leotard's radical insight is that reality is a discursive effect, a process. He writes, Reality is not what is given to this or that subject. It is a state of the referent, that about which one speaks which results from the effectuation of establishment procedures defined by a unanimously agreed upon protocol. Put simply, reality is something we produce through speech. Now, it is easy to miss the nuance here and think that postmodernism 
denies the physical properties of the universe or some other nonsense. The point here is much subtler. It is to say that in discourse, there can be no such thing as a false belief. If it is believed, it is true for the believer. Truth here is a rhetorical artifact, a legitimating property. It is not a contradiction to say that it is a fact that climate change is a hoax at the same time that its existence is also a fact. This is possible because facticity itself is contested. The two previous utterances are incomparable because they operate according to entirely different sets of rules. Still clinging to the Enlightenment's privileging of vision above all other senses, the experts of the social dilemma hold that seeing is believing. And then you look over at the other side, and you start to think, how can those people be so stupid? Look at all of this information that I'm constantly seeing. How are they not seeing that same information? And the answer is, they're not seeing that same information. The problem for them is that we are not all seeing the same factual information. Nowhere does it occur to them that all news is fake to those not inducted into its phrasal regimen. This is the sense in which truth is not truth. Divorced from a universal meta-narrative, it floats freely, offering its volatile blessing to any wayward stooge with a half-baked epistemology. We can now move to the qualities of the film proper. A post-structural reading attends to a work's inherent features as well as to the web of circumstances surrounding its creation, and we will treat each in turn. First off, were you also annoyed by this excessively lengthy and pointless introduction which forces you to watch these people sit around and clear their throats? Why include this at all? The purpose of it seems to be to affect an atmosphere of authenticity and candor. Seeing these people shift in their chairs and mumble about their lawyers tempers the viewer, indicates that what we're about to hear is the unvarnished truth. These architects of our social order are like us. They have worries and fears the same as we do. How are you doing today? <sighs> I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah. Watching the rehearsal before the show demonstrates Netflix's willingness to go behind the curtain, a revelatory motion that mirrors the stated aim of the film as a whole. This is a technique of legitimation common to new documentaries. If you cannot hide the artifice, put it front and center, make it work for you. And what of the film's fictional element, the story of a boy whose crushing social alienation leads him down a path of extremism? First of all, the cop-out of having him fall for the propaganda of the oxymoronic extreme center is laughable. Centrism definitionally cannot be extreme. Here the film's commitment to achieving consensus defangs its message. It is a relentless both sidesism which undermines its claim that democracy functions more smoothly with less polarization. So, in a contradictory way, the political center, which the film endorses, Europe's traditional centrist coalition lost its majority while far-right and far-left populist parties made gains, becomes the only position which it can depict as extreme, albeit vaguely and inoffensively. But more broadly, these segments are what Leotard calls the return of the narrative in the non-narrative. Scientists must play by the rules of the narrative game, its influence remains considerable not only on the users of the media, but also on the scientists' sentiments. In other words, science cannot deny the power of narrative understanding even as it derides its methodology. Rationally, there is no reason why the social dilemma ought to include these segments, since they overwhelmingly restate the points made by the experts. But their inclusion helps us to recognize that the film operates in multiple phrasal regimes, trying to reach the broadest possible consensus. And yet the fact that the information can be translated between these regimens at all indicates that they are more homogeneous than they might appear. Thus we realize the film will never change the minds of those it deems the most vulnerable, because it cannot speak in their register. But if this was never the film's intention, we are left with only one other profit. At first this point might sound naive. Of course Netflix pursues financial gain in order to fund its content. Both Leotard and the film point out that knowledge has become a saleable commodity in the postmodern era. Knowledge ceases to be an end in itself. It loses its use value. The media has this exact same problem where their business model by and large is that they're selling our attention to advertisers. 
It is left unstated that the same algorithmic logics that the film says are responsible for an existential threat to humanity are precisely those which determined that The Social Dilemma would be a sound investment for Netflix. The same algorithms determined that you would watch the film after featuring it on your homepage, and the same algorithms now know that you will consume more content about our technological undoing. Our data made the film's production feasible, as it will for countless exposés to come. Perversely, it is our enjoyment of our own manipulation, projected back at us in commodity form, which allows the proliferation of these social media practices and the industries they sustain. The social dilemma is our dilemma, not theirs. For capital, it is an opportunity. The writer A.F. Cannon notes that the film shows us a central problem of today's capitalism, i.e. its remarkable ability to profit from both endorsements and attacks. The social dilemma reveals that negativity is a form of entertainment, and that negativity about entertainment is also a form of entertainment. This is a concept known as recuperation, first formulated by Guy Dubois and the Situationist International. Originally describing how revolutionary concepts were inverted in their meaning and thereby rendered impotent, recuperation has come to mean the reabsorption of any anti-capitalist effort, which at once nullifies its revolutionary character and enlists it in the service of capital. Recuperation performs our critique for us. It sanitizes revolt into a more benign state of being informed. It packages our dissent in the convenient, consumable format of streaming content. What is content? A stream, a flow, undifferentiated and unceasing. Content is boundless. Finish one program and you are rolled into the next, already attuned to your tastes by the omniscient algorithm. Psalm 38, 9. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my sighing is not hid from thee. Our sighs give breath to the engines of our stupefaction. Our wailing is our unwinding, our gnashing is our chill. Post-truth unleashes pure packets of information in their sleekest form, data at its most malleable, conducive to any purpose and any knowledge regime, so long as it is deemed profitable. Smarting like an atavistic bone protruding through the skin, narrativity gores us from the inside out. The thin paper mache gives way easily, and we stare dumbly at the gash as we skip the credits and resume the flow. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you like these crossovers between pop culture, theory, and philosophy, I hope you'll give the video a like and subscribe for more. See you next time.